The Pulse of Providence with Steph Machado on WPRI.com. Hello and welcome to the first episode of The Pulse of Providence. I'm Steph Machado and I'm really excited to launch this new show here on WPRI.com where we are going to tackle all of the issues in the capital city from uh, housing to the schools to economic development, race, policing, and of course politics. Um, we're launching the show remotely because of the pandemic. I'm here in my living room in the city of Providence, and we thought it was only appropriate to ask the mayor of Providence, Jorge Lorza, to be the first guest on a show about all things Providence. So welcome, Mayor, and thank you for joining me. Well, it's great to be on here, Steph. Congratulations on launching this new show, and it really is an honor to be on here with you for this first program. And Mayor, I want to start with the pandemic, which has been hitting Providence uh, particularly hard, um, which, you know, is to be expected if you're the largest city um, in the state. But we are also seeing a divide between the different neighborhoods of the city of Providence and how they're affected. Um, I have some numbers. The 02909 zip code, which includes Silver Lake and Olneyville, has nearly 2,000 coronavirus cases confirmed while 02903 on the east side has 172 cases. And there's obviously you know, a racial and economic divide between the zip codes that we're seeing, the hardest hit in the city, and uh, the ones that are not. So what are you doing to solve this? Yeah, you know, the, um, the past few months have been really difficult for all of us throughout the, frankly, throughout the world. And especially for folks concentrated in central cities where people live closer together. You know, we're, we're hit harder, harder than anybody else. And I think that, you know, one of the lasting, uh, perhaps the lasting issue of the, of the virus has been and will continue to be the disproportionate impact that it's having on already vulnerable communities. And, uh, you know, we've learned a lot about the virus. We know a lot more about how it spreads and where it spreads. And I think that a lot of people are, uh, are, are, getting, uh, are, are getting the virus uh, because of where they work. They, they work in a, in a kitchen, um, you know, tight quarters, uh, or they work in congregate living facilities, or they're nurses and CNAs. They come in close contact with other folks. So, yes, you're, you're more likely to catch the virus in those settings. But then, to top it off, then folks come back to their home. They live in double and triple deckers, and uh, you simply expose more people to the virus when you have it, uh, when you have it as well. So, unfortunately, it is a virus that is impacting low-income communities, already vulnerable communities, harder than, harder than anyone else. And so how do you address it? You have to address those issues head on. That's why we've focused directly with communities of color, with low-income communities, and we have targeted approaches to each of those, to those communities. So it's really important to make sure that we have broad and easily accessible testing capacity. Uh, we have the CVS centers, we have and Twin River at the state level. But we also need to have places at the community level that people can just walk to and that can people you know, can drive right around the corner to whenever they need to. So we're working with the Providence Community Health Centers. We're working with Clinica Esperanza, with the Rhode Island Free Clinic, with Open Door Health, with all of these community-based health agencies that have existing relationships with their constituents and folks in the community. It makes it a lot easier for people to find, to access, and to trust to be able to go and, and, and get those exams. So we, we're still encouraging everyone to please get out there and get tested, but it's incumbent upon us to make sure that you know, folks have easy accessibility to it and all of the information that they need so that they're taking the right precautions. And are there more of those sites coming there? Because I think a lot of those testing sites you just mentioned, the walk-up sites opened in April and May, and we have known about these factors for four months, the fact that people live in closer quarters and, and work certain jobs that are making them more exposed. So what more can be done? Is it more testing sites, more you know, information about how to get um, tested or get treated? Mm -hmm. I think it's a combination of everything. So we're working with the state right now con to, condes to condense some of the testing capacity that we have at the state level and to bring it all together in one place. Uh, we, we're, we're at an interesting point right now. It's not a situation such as, let's say, Florida, where you have long lines uh, of folks waiting to get tested. Here, we have more testing capacity than we have people taking advantage of it. And so it's really a matter of making sure that people are taking the precautions, that people know how to access the testing, 
and and that, that uh, word gets word gets out there about you know what kind of resources are available to you if you are feeling any of these any of these symptoms. So it's a little bit of a little bit of everything. It's uh, public communication. It's uh, more testing capacity. It's additional resources to the community, and only in that way can we address this. It has to be multifaceted because this virus is also has you know layers upon layers of impact that it's having on our community. Um, the state just a really short time ago announced, and I should note we're taping this on Monday afternoon. Um, they're going to open a new testing site in the convention center garage and close the RIC testing site. Um, do you agree with this decision? I don't think of the convention center garage as somewhere that's super walkable, um, but mm -hmm. neither is RIC if you live you know, on the other side of the city. So what do you think about this change? Yeah, we've been in close touch with, with the state on, on, all of these, uh, on all of these decisions that they've made. One of the challenges that we had with Rick is that it's so far yeah, you know, out of the center of the city that unless you have a car, it's, um, it's, it's, it's really difficult to access. And so I do think that a, a center right closer to downtown, right next to Kennedy Plaza is gonna be a lot, is gonna be a lot easier. But remember that that's just one of our testing sites. We're still committed to investing in the community-based testing sites. And what we're hearing from folks is that Sometimes they just don't know, or sometimes they just don't trust uh, some of the larger, more established, or sort of formal looking sites. And they feel a lot more comfortable visiting either the health care provider that they already have a relationship with, or one that's more accessible and around the corner in their neighborhood. So we're still committed to, to providing those options for folks. Um, Mayor, if the numbers start going up and we see whether it's a second wave or just an, an uptick that in, in yourself and governor start considering re-implementing restrictions. Would you consider implementing restrictions differently based on zip code because of how the virus is hitting certain neighborhoods harder than others? So let me, let me begin by just saying in general that uh, we're not taking anything off the table. However, doing something zip code based, I think would be very, very difficult and I'm not sure how productive it would be. And, and the reason for that is that, you know, folks move around so fluidly in that, um, you know, the idea behind doing it by zip code or by neighborhood would be so you can contain it in that neighborhood, but folks will be moving in and out of it. So I think it would defeat the purpose. Uh, with that said, all of the decisions that we make, first of all, they're, they're all excruciating, very difficult decisions, right? There are no easy calls here. But all of the decisions that we made, they're, they're driven by the virus. Really, it's the virus that makes those decisions. Um, we follow all of the evidence we listen to. We listen to the doctors and the scientists and what they're saying. And they're going to drive the decisions that we make. Uh, we, we're at a point right now where we are seeing a slight uptick and the numbers are curving back, back up. So it's certainly reason for concern. Um, but uh, that's why you have to stay on top of it and you have to keep a close eye and continue communicating with the public. And hopefully we're not going to see another spike. Hopefully it'll just be a lull and the numbers will continue to go back down. Um, but again, it's something that uh, the virus will be making these decisions for us. And, uh, you know, the data is going to determine whether we move to another step of reopening, whether we halt or maybe even whether we take a step back. What would be potentially the first thing that you would close again in the city of Providence? Is it indoor dining? Is it, you know, what would it be? Yeah, for example, so we've learned a lot about how the, how the virus spreads. And uh, at this point, I am much more concerned about uh, indoor gatherings than outdoor gatherings. So what we would likely do, we will look at uh, some, of the, some of the restrictions um, on, uh, on indoor gatherings. And it, there's a lot that we can do, but it would all be specific to what the numbers and the data are telling us. So um, it, it really depends on where the spike is and what we can glean from that data, from that data, and uh, try to tune our our um, uh, our additional steps or restrictions to wherever we feel there's there's a need because there's growing cases in that specific space. So it all depends once again on the data, and it depends on the virus. Do you think it's safe at this point for um, Providence school children to go back to school full time, five days a week? That's obviously an indoor setting. And, and we know at least at the moment that the guidelines are that once the kids get into their classroom um, and in their stable group, they'll be able to take their mask off 
Uh, do you think that that's a good move at this point? You know, I, I mentioned a second ago that these are all difficult decisions, and this is like the, this is yeah. the mother of all difficult decisions. It's um, you know, it, it really is a a a, a no win situation in terms of the decisions at this point. And I'll tell you, rather than comment on the actual decision, I think that the most important thing is to trust the process for how you get to those decisions. And uh, um, I know the school department is closely monitoring the um, the data and what it's telling us, everything from how it spreads, but also to who it spreads with and who's at and who's at greatest risk. Uh, we have to watch watch all of that data. And at this point, the the smartest thing that uh, any district can do is to make sure that they have at least three plans one where school is completely closed one is where it's entirely in person and one a hybrid plan and just be ready to execute on either one of those plans as you get closer to to school start date on um on, on the most appropriate one given what the data and what where the virus is at at that point it's an incredibly do you have an, difficult have an opinion decision. at this point, though. Do you have an opinion at this point, though, about which of those plans makes the most sense? Let's say school was going to start tomorrow, and I know that the state has taken control of the school, so you don't have sort of a direct say. But your opinion will matter significantly if you say, "I think we got to go hybrid." Um, you know, the mayor of Providence saying that has holds weight. So, do you have an opinion at this point on whether it should be the hybrid or the full in person? Yeah, I mean, so ideally, ideally things will be safe enough so that kids can study in person, right? Um, we know that kids are losing out on learning by not being in school and distance learning. Folks are making the, the most of it um, while, you know, while they have to, but it's not ideal. So ideally, the data would tell us that it'd be safe and okay to go back to school uh, in person in the fall. But again, at this point, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it behooves any one of us to say, this is the, the decision that should be made. I think that every district should have those three plans and be ready to execute on every one of them so that as the picture becomes clearer in the next month, month and change, and the decision needs to be made, then at that point, the district is ready to execute on whichever, whichever one makes the most sense at that point. The last thing that I'll mention is that um, you know, this is going to be a fluid situation until a vaccine is found, and it's very possible that Whatever, uh, whatever decision is made with respect to schools at the beginning of the year could also change as the school year progresses. It could be that it starts off virtual, but then slowly goes into a hybrid. It could be that it starts off in person, but then goes into, into virtual. So everything really needs to be on the table. And so the important thing to do is, given the uncertainty, is plan for, have a plan for each one of these three scenarios and then be ready to execute given where we are with the virus at the time when the decision needs to be made. Um, I'm wondering if there's a question of equity as well with, with what you just described. Um, we know that the virus is affecting certain neighborhoods worse. If the schools in that those neighborhoods maybe have an outbreak of the virus and have to go virtual learning, but the schools say on the east side don't, is there a educational equity issue there where a chunk of students in certain areas have to be learning from home and other students can go to school. Yeah, there, there are education equity issues across the board here. And uh, that's what's so tough about this virus is that, you know, we're seeing the disproportionate impact that it's having across the board. Um, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, people who are in the most vulnerable position are the ones that are being, um, uh, are the ones that are being, affected by this most, uh, 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 most, most adversely. So it's an unfortunate part of the reality, uh, but um, that's all the more reason why we need to plan accordingly so that we can mitigate much of this uh, disproportionate impact that it's having on our vulnerable communities. Uh, I wanna move on to the city budget and finances, which of course have been affected um, by the pandemic. We are now, is it the 20th? We are 20 days into the new fiscal year. There is not an FY21 budget yet. Um, you are asking folks to pay their taxes for FY21, which I believe are due on Friday. Um, so what can you say to the, the taxpayers of Providence about when there's going to be a plan on how you're going to spend their dollars for the next year? Yeah, you know, everything has been just twisted uh, upside down. Um, and uh, this is uncharted territory for, for all of us. Uh, in, the, in the time that I've been mayor, 
uh, throughout these five and a half years. We've been really responsible with our finances. We've passed uh, our budgets. We've balanced our budgets. And we've improved our finances from the time that I took office until today. But given the extraordinary circumstances with the virus, uh, we do not have a budget up until this time. So we don't have a spending plan um, or a, spend, a new spending plan for fiscal year 21. That doesn't mean that there is no spending plan. It simply reverts back to the spending plan from the previous year. So we're still held accountable uh, to, um, uh, to, to abide by those limits that we have for fiscal year 20. Um, but what we're doing is uh, we're taking what I believe is the, is, is, the, is the right approach, which is waiting to see what kind of revenue we'll, we'll, um, uh, we'll be receiving from the state and from the federal government. It's encouraging that there's a, a, lot of, um, a lot of talk about Congress reconvening and taking up another, another round of the CARES Act, another stimulus round. So we've been advocating uh, directly with leaders in, the, in Congress through the United States Congress of Mayor, Conference of Mayors uh, to get direct aid to municipalities and to states. I mean, that lifeline is gonna go such a long way so that we can continue to provide the services that our community is relying on. If we don't get that support from the federal government, then uh, you know, I'm really concerned both about our city's finances. Uh, we're gonna have to make some really, really painful and difficult cuts, um, number one. Uh, but then second, it's going to limit our ability to provide uh, the, uh, the services at a time when uh, vulnerable people in our community need it the most. So um, I'm really concerned of what, uh, what will happen um, if the federal government doesn't step in and pass another stimulus round. But hopefully, they'll be able to come together and do something that works for our country and works for our cities and states. How long are you willing to wait? You know, we know Congress sometimes tends to drag their feet and, and get into disagreements. So are you willing to wait into August or even further before saying, okay, we, it's time, we got to make the decisions. We got to start making these cuts. Yeah, they would have to make a decision. I would assume by, by the time they, you know, when they reconvene in early, you know, early August, they would have to make a decision. If it gets to late August and they still haven't made the decision, I think it'd be fair to assume, unless we hear otherwise, it'd be fair to assume that there is no new round of federal, federal stimulus coming, and then we just have to move forward. Now, we're not waiting for that day to come to and start looking at where we would cut if we have to drop by 5, 10, 15, even 30 percent. All of our directors have been put on notice that and they may need to make some difficult cuts, so they have to start identifying where these cuts would come from. So we're not waiting for that day. I mean, we're not going to be caught flat-footed. Uh, we hope it doesn't come, but if it comes, uh, we'll be ready to make the decision as the time requires. Um, and do you think the city's cash flow is in a good position right now? Uh, do you anticipate needing to borrow money or dip into the rainy day fund at all? So we're, we're at a decent place right now. Uh, we, uh, the, um, our, our tax revenue remained strong in the last quarter of last year, uh, but still, given the uncertainty of the, of the federal, uh, of, the, of the state revenue coming in, uh, we have begun the process of taking a line of credit uh, to essentially bridge the gap between when the payments come due and when the, um, and when the, and when the money, the cash comes in. So we're in a decent place. Uh, we're not taking any chances. We have started the process for a line of credit, however, and uh, hopefully we'll get uh, we'll hear about relief coming from the state and the feds uh, before we have to get too far into that. Have We've you actually sorry, at, have you actually have you actually pulled the trigger to borrow that money? Uh, I don't believe so. Not at this. Uh, I don't believe we have at this point. Uh, but uh, we've had the conversations with the city council to get that to get that up and moving. So, um, if and when it um, it is required, we're ready to do it. Okay. Um, and on the topic of making cuts to the budget, obviously the police department is a big conversation right now. A lot of folks are calling to defund the police, which for some people means they just want to decrease funding to the police and put that money towards other. Uh, priorities, but for other people, they want to abolish it altogether. I, I know that second um, option is not on the table, but do you think that there will be cuts to the police department um, that reflect what these community members are asking for? Well, it's something that we're looking, we're, that we're looking at and something that um, and I've said from the very beginning, 
I'm not only open to, but uh, I'm eager to look into is how do we reallocate resources more effectively? You know, our police officers, they're asked to do so much more than they were asked to do, say, a generation ago. And uh, you, really have to, you really have to ask, you know, when, when we send a police officer uh, to a call where someone is suicidal and uh, having a mental episode, is that the best use of our resources? Is that the best uh, provision of services? Are they the best equipped to, to handle those kinds of situations? You know, we get tons of noise complaints. And do we really need to send someone with a badge and a gun uh, to, to handle that? And is that really the best use of police officers' time? You know, police officers today, they're, they're grief counselors, they're social service providers, they're mentors. They're all of these different things. And, uh, um, you know, sh should those roles be played by someone with a badge and a gun? So just as we did 20 years ago, when the idea of community policing was introduced. Providence went all in at an early point with community policing. You know, there was a lot of resistance to it. A lot of people poo-pooed it and said, you know, this is, this is ridiculous. Um, and uh, uh, look at where we are now. You know, in, in the 90s, we had anywhere from 60 to 70 more police officers than we do today. But because of community policing, we're at record low levels of crime. And so there's a smarter way to do policing. And uh, this conversation about reallocating resources and investing in different services, I see this as the, the new iteration of that same process. And it's an exciting, an exciting process to go through because we can ask ourselves, what does policing of the future look like? And how do we invest in it today so that we are you know, not just allocating our, our resources more efficiently, but also providing better and better services to the community? Um, so I think that there's a there's a way that this can turn into a win-win all around. So it's a it's a conversation that I'm very eager to uh, to to engage in, and uh, we started looking at different models, and we're eager to make those investments. You talk about that social service unit that's being considered that could divert some of the 911 calls to mental health counselors or or other folks that are not police officers. The only way that that actually realizes savings in the police department is if you cut personnel in the police department, right? Because they're not responding to as many calls. Um, we know that around 90% of the police budget is salaries and benefits. So are you willing to cut personnel in the police department and have fewer officers? So, so, so we're, looking, we're looking at that, but this, this is a, this is, these are all plans over the long term. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the, the budget that I submitted to the city council a month ago included a new academy uh, for, for new police officers. So the question on the table is, do we really need those, those new officers or do we invest or do we invest the monies in, in, in other areas? So that's what we're currently looking at. And uh, um, I'm going through this process together with the city council. I'm confident that we're going to land in a very, very good place that positions us on the front lines of what policing in the future looks like. And not only does it put us in a place where uh, we um, are uh, saving, uh, saving dollars in our, in our budget, but also, most importantly, puts us in a place where we're providing better services to the community. And so that would be a win-win all around. You think the academy should be canceled or could be canceled? Now, we're looking at a number of different things. So, I mean, there's options of uh, reducing the size. There's options of delaying it. Uh, there are a lot of different things that we're looking at right now. Uh, but, you know, it's all how do you balance all the competing interests that you have and how do you, you know, plan for the long term and use each budget uh, to, to be part of that strategic plan to get you there over the long term. So um, it's, it's, it's all being considered right now. I understand the city needs a new uh, facility for the academy. You put out an RFP for that. So if you don't have the academy, that would be another potential money saving opportunity for this year, right? Right. Okay. Um, speaking of the city's finances, last week you made an announcement about um, studying, doing potential reparations for the African American and indigenous communities here in Providence. Uh, how how realistic is that? There was a little bit of skepticism saying the city is having all these financial problems. We're talking about potentially taking out a line of credit. How do you afford uh, payments to these communities in the current financial picture? Yeah, so you know a lot of a lot of folks have had questions of uh, 
what shape will reparations take, um, what will be the scale, how long will they last, who will be eligible. And let me say that all of those are legitimate questions to have about reparations, uh, but they're questions for another day. Uh, what we announced last week was a commitment to a process. And the process uh, is gonna go in three, in three phases. The first phase is gonna be a truth telling process. Now we have to uncover um, our history, uh, our, uh, our history with slavery, our history with discrimination. And uh, that's gonna take a little bit of time. Some of that work has already been done by other organizations. So we'll build off of the work that they've done. Uh, but we have to gather that, that data and compile it, put it all in one place where it's easily accessible. That will inform the next phase, which will be the reconciliation phase. And the reconciliation phase, that's the opportunity to bring folks together. Uh, as I've talked to leaders in the uh, black community, you know, I've been struck by, first of all, how deep the injuries run, but also how, but also by the fact that history isn't just a thing of the past. History is something that informs and shapes the present in very real ways. And through this reconciliation process, we can bring people together to have those conversations and see in the very real ways that discrimination of the past is actually discrimination of the future as well and is still impacting folks. I think that this has a, a, um, uh, this has a, a great potential to uh, help bring the community through a community healing process and uh, help us unite, uh, help us come, help us emerge as a much more united community. And so once those two phases are, are through, then it sets us up, well, we understand that there's been an injury. Well, what do we do about it? And at some point in the future, there'll be a committee that gets established. And that committee will be, uh, will be responsible uh, for making recommendations for what, rec for what reparations should be. And I'm very open to uh, what those recommendations are. Um, but it's important that we allow uh, black voices to lead the conversation. And once they set up those recommendations, then it's upon us to, to determine, okay, how do we make these a reality? There are a lot of cities that are experimenting with UBI, with universal basic income. So if that's something that the, that the committee says that we should look at, then we should look at it. If the community, if the, if the committee says, well, we need more community investments in, in these areas, well, then those are investments that we need to figure out a way to make. Um, there's a, there are also other recommendations such as you know, the, the, the city can continue to make the investments that it makes, but it should make them in a more race conscious way. And so that's another thing that we can take into account. And so the, to, to answer your question, those are all legitimate questions that we should ask, but they're questions for another day. And whatever the, uh, the recommendations are, then it's upon us to make sure they become a reality. You say they're questions for another day, you know, your term limited. So is this going to end up um, being the problem of the next mayor when they, when the next mayor tries to figure out his or her budget? Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't phrase it as a problem. I would, I would call it an opportunity. And I mean, the uh, my, you know, I mean, the, I mean for the yeah. financial to figure out where do you, if you're going to do UBI or going to do payments, where is this going to come from in the budget? I would say, I would say yes and no. So, you know, I don't, I don't expect this process to, um, uh, to, to take two and a half years to complete. It's something that I want to see done, uh, done right and done well, but also done with urgency. And I want to receive these recommendations so that we can start acting upon them right away. At the same time, I do think that there's a, the, the, there's the, uh, there's the opportunity for this to turn into a long-term plan that the city commits to. And, and that's a good thing. Um, there's no way that we're going to uh, make up for 400 years of discrimination in just one year or one set of investments. These are long-term investments that, that need to be made. And that's why it's so important for us as a city to put this marker on the ground that we're committed to this process. More than we're committed to you know, one particular outcome, we're committed to going through this process and then handling uh, whatever decisions and investments need to be made as they, as they come due through this process. And the process can certainly extend um, as long as it's needed, uh, as long as it's needed to make things right. Would you be willing to borrow money, you know, at taxpayer expense to pay for the reparations, whatever form they may take? Um, I mean, it's, it's interesting. We, you know, we have to start off being driven by let's do the right thing. 
Um, so two points come to mind. Um, you mentioned borrow money. We borrow money all of the time. And we borrow money for infrastructure, for in infrastructure investments. Uh, with those investments that we make, uh, perhaps the recommendations from the committee will be to invest these dollars in underrepresented, uh, underinvested neighborhoods. That's certainly something that, that we should that we should consider if that's what the recommendations come up with. Now, I'll also say that uh, I'm, I'm cognizant that there is no way that City of Providence, frankly, any city in the United States, uh, can uh, can make the black community whole for the injustices that they have suffered. Um, and so, you know, while uh, we're taking the lead on this at the at the municipal level, uh, we also need folks at the state level, folks at the federal level, and folks at the institutional level, both private and nonprofit, to step up and be part of the solution as well. So that's that's part of us jumping into this process. It's that uh, we also want to inspire others to to lean into it as well. It can't just be us, but uh, uh, nonetheless, we'll do our part and uh, we'll push as much as we can because what's right is right. And, uh, you know, this is the this is the right time to do it and it's the right thing to do. So it sounds like the answer is yes, this could potentially end up borrowing money depending on what it is. I mean, again, it, all legitimate questions, but um, they're, they're, they're questions to be answered um, at another day. And I think that the more that we're successful at getting people to engage in this process with us, um, whether you're inclined for it or inclined against it, I ask people to participate, be part of this process. And I truly do believe that we all, every human being, we have a moral instinct somewhere inside of us that when we are presented, we're, when we're faced with patent injustice, that we want to do something about it. And, uh, and the injustice is clear. Now the question is putting it front and center. Uh, what are we going to do about it? And these are questions for all of us in the community to decide, um, you know, how committed are we to this? And uh, will we right the wrongs of the past? And, uh, you know, my, my opinion on that is that our community will be strongly behind it, that uh, we'll see this as the right thing to do, and we'll want to do, we'll want to do the right thing. Got it. Um, Mayor, one more sort of financial um, issue that you're dealing with, and again, the future mayors are going to have to deal with is the pension fund. We had a Supreme Court decision a few weeks ago um, in favor of some retired firefighters who had some high, you know, compounding colas. Um, I, I mean, I know, I, I know that you're the actuaries are trying to figure out the financial um, impact of that Supreme Court decision, but it sounds like this is going to have uh, short-term and long-term impacts on the pension fund. You tried in the past to monetize the water system to help with the pension liability. No one wanted to do that. Uh, what can you do in the remaining years you have in your term? Yeah, so yeah, you mentioned the what we tried to do with the water supply board, and there was no appetite for that. And uh, the options that we had were very limited. And uh, unfortunately, with the Supreme Court opinion, it makes those options even more limited. You know, there there are definitely things that can be done you know there's you know asking things such as asking um, uh, employees to contribute more to their pension fund all those things can be considered but they have to go through uh, collective bargaining um, so so we should explore those kinds of things uh, but the reality is that the ability to do a once and for all um, uh, pension reform solution that solves this is going to be so much more difficult for not just my administration, but future administrations to do. Effectively, what the Supreme Court said is that you only get one crack at the apple. And uh, um, uh, Providence had that opportunity back in two, uh, 2011, 2012. And it's going to be incredibly difficult to do anything uh, once again on pension reform. So it was disappointing that they ruled that they ruled that way. Um, but um, but it is what it is. It's a Supreme Court opinion. Um, we're going to be fine for the next couple of years. But my big concern is that the pension liability continues to increase each each year, and uh, uh, as our payments continue to increase, it squeezes out other investments in the budget. 
And so over the next couple of years, I would hate to see the city uh, continue to cut, 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 um, and going deeper into the bone and uh, um, slowly and, and slowly eroding the vibrancy that we're seeing right now. Um, so that's my main concern. We likely are not going to see this all come to a head anytime, I'd say, in the next maybe five, six, seven years. Um, but certainly in the out years, maybe a decade from now, um, whoever's mayor at that time is going to have to confront this. And the tools that that person will have at their disposal are going to be so much more limited and than uh, they were before the Supreme Court opinion. So are you going to try and go now to either the current employees unions or the retirees to negotiate uh, changes? Is that something you can do while you're still mayor? Those are conversations that we that we have started. Um, but you know, the, remember that 90% of the li unfunded liability is for current retirees. So we're talking about, and it's actually less than that, I believe. So you take all current and future employees. Uh, the, the liability associated, unfunded liability associated with them is only somewhere between 8 to 10%. So let's say even under best case scenario, you get uh, um, dramatic concessions from current and future employees to reduce, uh, uh, to reduce the city's portion of the, that pension liability. We're talking reducing it, what, from 8 to maybe 6%? That would be a 25% improvement on the city's part. But... In the grand scheme of things, it would only be reducing the whole unfunded liability from 100% to 98%, only a 2% difference. So, um, you know, there, there are things that the city should consider, um, but uh, make no mistake about it, there are minimal, minimal um, interventions compared to the scale of the unfunded liability. Um Mayor, before I let you go, and uh, thank you for taking all the time to talk with me, but I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask about politics. As we mentioned, your term is is up, um, your term limited. How serious are you about a run for governor in 2022? Honestly, Steph, we'll see, we'll see what the future holds. Uh, I will say that I am blessed in that I have the best job in the world. I think being mayor of Providence is the best political job in the state. Um, I would also say it's probably the most difficult political job in the state. And, uh, you know, as, as, I, as I look at, you know, potentially running statewide, um, that decision will have to be made at some point in the future. Um, but I know that whether that opportunity is available and that door is open depends entirely on how good a job I've done at running the city. So I'm going to continue to focus on that, running the city as best we can, making it one of America's great mid-sized cities. And, uh, and by carrying on that focus, if there's a window of opportunity at some point in the future to run statewide, then I'll explore it. Um, but as of right now, my focus is 100% on the best job that I've ever had, which is being mayor of Providence. All right, Mayor Jorge Lorza, thank you so much um, for joining me on the very first episode of The Pulse of Providence. Uh, it was great having you. And for everyone watching at home, uh, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.